Welcome to Organic Chemistry, Chemistry 651. This video lecture replaces the one that I would normally have given in person Friday, September 30th, 2016. So I hope you'll take the time to listen and watch the entire video. It'll be approximately the same length as a normal classroom lecture um, and it'll have all the same information in it. So please watch the whole thing and be ready to go. When I come back on Monday, I will expect that you've watched the entire video um, and you're right up to speed with everything that's, that's covered. So what are we going to do today? Today we're going to talk about a couple of things. Number one, I'm actually going to jump back into chapter three. I know in the last lecture we started chapter four, stereochemistry, but I realized that I had inadvertently skipped um, one simple topic namely that of enines. These are molecules that contain both an alkene and an alkyne. So I'm going to jump back into chapter three ever so briefly just to cover enines and in particular how do we name them. Uh, and then we'll come right back to chapter four stereochemistry and we'll pick up where we left off and learn some more stereochemical concepts. So here we go. Let's begin with enines. So as I mentioned a moment ago, Enines are molecules that have both an alkene and an alkyne functional group in the same molecule, and they're actually fairly common. Now, you don't necessarily have to treat these as molecules that are different than alkenes and or alkynes. Um, it turns out, uh, depending upon how the two uh, functional groups, or depending upon where the two functional groups are located, they might be a little bit different than um, molecules that have only alkene or only alkyne functions, but uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the semester once we start talking about conjugated pi systems. Um, much more about that later. Right now, all we really need to know is that these molecules exist and um, we're going to have to deal with them. So you look at this molecule right here, we have an alkene function and we have an alkyne function and they're located within the same molecule. Um, for naming purposes, we've got to figure out how to number a molecule like this. And it's actually quite simple. When we had alkenes all by themselves, we numbered the longest chain that contained the alkene in such a way that the alkene function got the lowest possible positional number. So that was giving the alkene precedence irrespective of any alkyl group substitu substituents or halogen substituents that might be present. The alkene took precedence over those groups. And then when we got to alkynes, we said very similar things for the alkyne. We found the longest chain that contained the alkyne, and the alkyne took precedence over things like alkyl groups and halogens. Well, with enines, we're going to find the longest chain that contains both the alkene and the alkyne, and we're simply going to number in such a way that we give the combination of multiple bonds the lowest possible positional numbers. So you can see in this molecule, that would mean I would have to number from the left, because if I number from the left, then I get one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in total, and my alkene would start at one, and my alkyne would start at four, so the positional numbers for the set of multiple bonds would be one, four. If I had numbered from the right, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six. It would be a two, five set of positional numbers for my multiple bonds rather than one, four. So I'm gonna number one, two, three, four, five, six in that fashion right there. So that's the general idea. We're going to number in such a way as to give the entire set of uh, multiple bonds the lowest possible positional numbers. Now, beyond that, the naming is going to be somewhat similar to what we've already done, almost exactly similar, but with one little twist. Here we have a six carbon longest chain. So this if it were an alkane, it would be a hexane. If it were an alkene, it would be a hexene. If it were an alkyne, it would be a hexine. Since it's got both ene and ine functions in it, we're going to include both of those in the name. We'll start with the ene. So it's one hexene. And notice that I don't finish the ene with an e ending. I cut it short here. One hexene. And the alkyne starts at carbon 4. So I name it a 1-hexene-4-ine. 
it's an enine. The one describing the location of the alkene and the four describing the location of the alkyne. Let's look at another couple of examples. Here, this top molecule, I have an alkyne and an alkene once again. If I started numbering from the right, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So from the right, a five, seven uh, set of positional numbers for my multiple bonds. From the left, one, two, three, four, five, three, five. So I'm going to want a number from the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now in this case, unlike the first example, let me go back to our first example again. The alkene function here did not require cis or trans or E or Z because it was a terminal alkene. Another way of thinking of that is that if you think about what's bound at carbon one, it's a couple of hydrogens. So if you tried to use the EZ notational system there, you couldn't do it. There's no way to break the tie between two hydrogens. If EZ doesn't work, then it's never going to be necessary to use it or to use cis or trans for that matter. Here with the alkene that starts at carbon five, you can clearly see that we have a trans arrangement of this large alkyl group and this large alkyne containing organic group. That's trans. Trans would be okay here. You could use trans in the name because the alkene carbons, 5 and 6, have one and only one substituent each. Again, in case of carbon 5, it's this large group here. In the case of carbon 6, it's this large group here. Otherwise, there's just a couple of hydrogens attached at carbons 5 and 6. So trans would be okay. But we can also use the EZ notational system here as well. And in this case, our two highest rank groups at carbon 5, clearly that's going to be the carbon not the hydrogen, so this would be our highest ranked group at carbon 5. And at carbon 6, once again it's going to be the carbon rather than hydrogen, so the entire group is our highest ranked group. Our highest ranked groups are on opposite sides, so we would call this an E alkene. So either trans or E works in this case. We'll come back and name the entire molecule in just a moment, but it's an enine once again. Actually, let's just go ahead and name it right now. Since it's an enine um, with 10 carbons, it's going to be a desenine. So we want to say the location of the alkene first with the E or trans designation in the front. I think I'll use E. This is an E5 desene. 3 ine. Again, naming it as an ene ine, so the ene comes first. It's a 5 desene 3 ine, according to our numbering. If I had wanted, I could have put the trans in place of the E there. You don't want to use both, it's one or the other. Okay? Now let's move down to this last example here. And in this case, you see that when we number from the left, 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, seven, so it's two, five for the alkene and the alkyne. And if I number from the right, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's two, five in both directions. So this is a tie. Essentially, whether we number from the left or the right, my multiple bonds are going to get the same set of positional numbers. And so we've got a little tiebreaker rule here. In cases of a tie, it's the alkene group that takes precedence over the alkyne. So what that means is I'm going to number from the left in order to give the alkene the lower possible positional number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven now. So I've got a heptenine. Notice that my alkene will require either E or Z, or in this case, cis or trans would work again. This is either going to be cis or Z. My two highest rank groups are on the same side. And so we can go ahead and give the molecule its proper name. I'm once again going to use 
the Z rather than the cis designation. Z, alkene starts at carbon 2, 2, heptene, alkyne starts at carbon 5, 5, ine. It's a Z, 2 heptene, 5 ine. Okay, so <clears throat> that gives us everything we need to know for the time being about enines. And uh, as I said a little bit later this semester when we get into conjugated pi systems, we'll figure out that there actually uh, are some differences between molecules that could be named as dienes or enines, depending upon where those pi bonds are located relative to one another. But that's a detail and uh, we're not quite ready to talk about that yet. We are, however, ready to jump back into stereochemistry. So last time we covered quite a bit. We talked about the notion of chiral compounds and the property of chirality. And we talked about achiral compounds. Achiral compounds are just going to be compounds that are not chiral. We talked about enantiomers and the fact that enantiomers always exist in pairs, like your left hand and your right hand. We talked about these... Uh, term stereogenic center or stereogenic carbon. It turns out that a stereogenic center doesn't have to be a carbon atom, but for our purposes, most of the time it will be. So using the term stereogenic carbon is synonymous for us uh, with the term stereogenic center. And finally, we even talked about the RS notational system. So that's all in your notes from last time, but I'm actually going to spend some time right now reviewing some of these concepts because they're so important. We need to use them over and over again, so let's talk a little bit about all these terms. Chiral. Remember, chiral is this property of handedness. The Greeks noticed that their left hands uh, and their right hands were not superimposable with one another, so they were different. And um, although they're different, they're certainly quite similar to one another, have a lot of the same properties. Um, molecules, but behave much the same way in some cases. Some molecules, like your hands, are chiral. They have this property, property of handedness. And the way we've described it is that chiral compounds have a non-superimposable mirror image structure. So that's a really important idea. It's true of your hands and it's true of chiral compounds. If you draw the mirror image or look at the mirror image structure of a chiral compound, it will not be superimposable with the molecule that gave rise to the mirror image, just like your left hand and your right hand. If you put your left hand up in the mirror and look at the reflection, or look at the mirror image, I should say, it's not your left hand, it's your right hand. So your hands are not superimposable with their mirror image. They are each chiral objects. Well, we've already mentioned that Chiral compounds exist in pairs, and we call those enantiomers. So you could refer to a pair of enantiomers as a molecule and its non-superimposable mirror image structure. Enantiomers, very important term for us. We're going to use it over and over again. Achiral simply means not chiral, as we've discussed. There are lots of organic compounds that are not chiral. In fact, uh, we've been studying quite a few of them as we marched through alkanes and alkenes. The majority of the compounds we've observed so far have not been chiral. So keeping track of the achiral compounds is awfully important because there's a lot of them. So how do we distinguish between chiral and achiral compounds? Well, it's going to get easier with time and, and experience, but for the moment, at this starting point, we've talked about identifying these stereogenic centers or stereogenic carbon atoms as a carbon atom that is bound to four different atoms or groups. And when you see a stereogenic center, what we're going to do is we're going to designate it with an asterisk. And we're going to appreciate the fact that because the molecule has a stereogenic center, it could be chiral. And in fact, what I told you last time is that if the molecule has one and only one stereogenic center, it most definitely is chiral. So let's look at an example. 
I'm going to give you a, an example that's not quite the same as the one I gave you last time, but it's similar. Here I have a carbon, which is going to turn out to be a stereogenic center. It's bound to a methyl group and a bromine, and both of those bonds I'm showing in the plane of the board, or the paper. Coming out of the plane of the paper is this ethyl group, so it's a CH2, CH3 group. And then there's also going to be a hydrogen. So here's my molecule. And sure enough, this carbon right in the middle is in fact a stereogenic center. It's bound to four different atoms or groups. Note that the methyl group and the ethyl group are different from one another. It is true that if you're working out atom by atom, you encounter two carbon atoms initially, but the entirety of the group here, the ethyl group, is different than the methyl group. We treat those as different groups. So we've got a methyl, a bromine, an ethyl, and a hydrogen attached to this carbon. That's four different atoms or groups. It's a stereogenic center. We're going to put an asterisk on that carbon. Now, because it's a stereogenic center, and because there's only one stereogenic center in the molecule, look at the other carbon atoms. You can see this carbon is attached to three hydrogens. If a carbon is attached to two or more of the same groups, it can't be a stereogenic center. So this carbon is attached to three hydrogens. It's not a stereogenic center. And each of these two carbons are attached to multiple hydrogens, either two or three, respectively. Once again, if you see a carbon atom that is attached to two or more of the same groups, they don't have to be hydrogen atoms, just two or more of the same atoms or groups, it's not a stereogenic center. So this molecule in its entirety has only one stereogenic center. This is a chiral compound. Compounds with only one stereogenic center will always be chiral. What does that mean? It means it exists much like either your left hand or your right hand. It has a partner which is its mirror image, and it's non-superimposable with that mirror image structure. We're talking about, of course, a pair of enantiomers. So that's one of the enantiomers. The other one would be the mirror image. So let's draw the mirror image over here. I've drawn a mirror plane here, and now over here I'm drawing what would be the mirror image of this structure. So I'm going to have the ethyl group coming out of the plane of the paper just as before but moving away in this direction since it's further away from the mirror plane and likewise the hydrogen is still in the back well this new mirror image structure I've just drawn has another stereogenic center the same one right there in the middle and here are my two compounds this is a pair of enantiomers now this is the point where we decided we're going to have to use some sort of a notational system in order to distinguish between these two. And this is nothing more than the RS notational system. The RS notational system. Again, this is a man-made, somewhat arbitrary notational system, but it allows us very nicely to distinguish one enantiomer from the other and to give them separate names. One will be called the R enantiomer and the other will be called the S enantiomer. And for naming purposes, we're going to put that R and or that S out in the front of the name so we know which enantiomer it is that we're talking about. Well, how do we figure out which one is R and which one is S? Remember what I told you last time. We're going to look at the stereogenic centers and we're going to rank the four different substituents that are attached to them. The four different atoms or groups that are attached are going to be ranked one to four. Now, if there's a hydrogen on there, as there is in this case, that's always going to be the lowest ranked group because we rank um, by atomic number, working out atom by atom, but our stereogenic center is bound directly to hydrogen. The carbon of the methyl group, the bromine, and the carbon of the ethyl group are all going to beat the hydrogen, so the hydrogen is going to be the lowest ranked group. We'll put it as number four. Otherwise, we've got a bromine and two carbons to compare to each other. The bromine clearly wins. The bromine is the highest ranked group. When we work out atom by atom, it's a carbon versus a carbon. Initially, that's a tie. 
But then remember, just as we did with easy notational system, we're going to work out atom by atom until the tie is broken. In the case of this carbon, it's only attached to hydrogen. So working out further, we can only go to a hydrogen. But this carbon of the ethyl group is attached to another carbon. Carbon beats hydrogen. So the next ranked group, number two, will be the entire ethyl group. That means the methyl group is number three. Now the way we use the RS notational system is that if the group of lowest priority, which is the hydrogen, is pointed to the back, that's going to be the case here and that's going to be the case whenever this is fairly easy to do and to do quickly. When the group of lowest priority is pointed to the back, we simply connect the dots from one to two to three. And if we get a clockwise rotation as we do here, one to two to three, that is R. On the other hand, if we got a counterclockwise rotation, that would be S. So clockwise rotation versus counterclockwise rotation. When we're connecting the dots, one to two to three, and the group of lowest priority is in the back, pointed to the back. So it's a very simple notational system, provided that group of lowest priority is pointing to the back. <clears throat> Let's go back to our molecule. One to two to three, once again, is a clockwise rotation. So this is going to be the R enantiomer. If we move over to the mirror image, we know these are supposed to be a pair of enantiomers, which means one should be R and one should be S. So it would be shocking here if this one did not turn out to be the S enantiomer. Something would have to be wrong. Once again, bromine is our highest ranked group, followed by the ethyl followed by the methyl, and finally the lowly hydrogen, the lowest ranked group. As before, the hydrogen is pointing to the back, as it should be. This is just the mirror image of that structure. As I go from one to two to three, I'm now moving in a counterclockwise direction. This is the S enantiomer. So sure enough, I have the R enantiomer here and the S enantiomer here exactly as expected. Now, if we were gonna name these compounds, Look carefully at these structures. <clears throat> this is actually a compound, or I should say these are compounds we've actually looked at before. We didn't appreciate they were chiral, though, in the past. If you look at the longest carbon chain of this alkyl bromide, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4 with the bromine at position 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. This is nothing more than a 2-bromobutane. 2 bromo butane and this one over here likewise is a 2 bromo butane make sure you can look at the structure and determine why it is that it's a 2 bromo butane 1 2 3 4 but clearly these are different molecules they're non superimposable one is the r enantiomer one is the s so we just need to include that information out at the front of the name. That becomes R-2-bromobutane, and this is the S-2-bromobutane. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, let me go ahead and draw 2-bromobutane the way we would have drawn it in the past. That's probably how we would have drawn 2-bromobutane in the past, not recognizing, because we hadn't studied it yet, that this was a chiral compound and it actually actually existed exists as a pair of enantiomers not as a single compound but as a pair of enantiomers you see what's wrong with this drawing that I've got right here is that I've got this carbon right here which is going to turn out to be a stereogenic center but I'm showing it with three bonds in the plane of the paper and as we discussed way back when if we're showing these molecules in a three-dimensionally more accurate way, then there should only be two bonds in the plane of the paper. So I'm going to go ahead and take my bromine and point it to the front, which necessarily means that the hydrogen, which wasn't shown, but it's there, 
and now I'm showing it, must be pointed to the back. So this would be a typical drawing of a two bromobutane, probably a little bit more typical than what I had drawn just a few minutes ago. It's the same molecule though. It's the same as one of those two molecules. Let's figure out which one this is. There's my stereogenic center with the bromine in the front. My highest rank group is bromine. Working out atom by atom, carbon versus carbon, it's a tie, but this carbon right here moves out to another carbon. This one only goes to a hydrogen. So the ethyl group right here is the second ranked group, followed by the methyl, number three, and the lowly hydrogen, the lowest ranked group. From one to two to three and back to one again, this is moving in a clockwise direction. I've drawn the R enantiomer here. <clears throat> now, once we start to get a little bit more familiar with the notion of a pair of enantiomers, much like uh, your left hand and your right hand, we recognize that there's always going to be this option of another molecule, in this case the very similar but unique S enantiomer. And so far we've talked about drawing that S enantiomer simply by doing the following, drawing it as the mirror image of this one because we know the definition of a pair of enantiomers is that they are non-superimposable mirror image structures. So if you have one of the enantiomers and you draw its mirror image, which we can do very quickly, then you necessarily have drawn the other enantiomer. And sure enough, from bromine to the ethyl to the methyl, this is a counterclockwise rotation, S, with the group of lowest priority, the hydrogen, not shown right now, but it's there and it's in the back. So that's how we've been drawing our pairs of enantiomers so far. We just simply figure out which one we're looking at first, we draw the mirror image, and that's the other one. But there's another way. Let me go back to the original drawing, that's this one right here. I'm going to put my bromine in the front. This is the R enantiomer. We've already gone through that little problem. We could just draw the mirror image, but it's going to turn out that it's also possible to move to a drawing which represents the other enantiomer, the S enantiomer, simply by keeping the two bonds that are in the plane of the paper as they are, but flipping the positions of the other two. So the bromine is in the front and the hydrogen is in the back. If I simply move the bromine to the back and the hydrogen to the front, this will in fact change the stereochemistry. These molecules will no longer be the same. They will be a pair of enantiomers as we've been discussing. Now to convince yourself that these two are in fact a pair of enantiomers. Think about sliding this molecule right here over on top of that molecule. You can see I've left the carbon backbone exactly the same in both of these drawings so it would be possible just to slide that carbon backbone right over in front and we would see that all four carbons would exactly superimpose with all four carbons there. But the bromine which is in front here would not superimpose with that bromine. This bromine's coming out of the plane of the paper. This bromine's going back behind. They're not superimposing. So these are non-superimposable compounds. Well, how do I know that one is the S? Well, it turns out if we redraw this and this time when I redraw it, I'm going to include the hydrogen. It turns out that in this case, our group of lowest priority emanating off of this stereogenic center is not pointing to the back, it's pointing to the front. That complicates things a little bit unless you remember this simple little trick. When the group of lowest priority is pointing to the front, you can determine R and or S in exactly the same way except whatever answer you get, flip it. So for example, Here's my stereogenic center. Bromine is the highest ranked group. The ethyl group is second. The methyl is third. As I go from one to two to three, this is a clockwise rotation. That would normally be R if the group of lowest priority was pointed to the back, like it is here. But 
When the group of lowest priority is in the front, we simply flip our answer. So from 1 to 2 to 3, that's normally R, but the group of lowest priority here is pointing to the front, so we go ahead and call that the S. Now if you look at the molecule we've just drawn here, and that molecule up there, they both are labeled S. And they're both two bromobutanes, which means they should be exactly the same compound. If they're exactly the same, they ought to be superimposable. So let's take our molecular spatula and put it under this molecule right here. We're going to take our molecular spatula, put it under this molecule, and we're going to flip it over and lay it on top of that structure. When I do that, when I flip it over and lay it on top of this structure right here, this methyl group flipped over would be on the left. The ethyl group, once this flips over, would be on the right, just as we have. Methyl on the left, ethyl on the right. The bromine, which is in the front, will flip to the back, just as it is here. And the hydrogen, which is in the back here, would flip to the front, just as it is here. So I hope you can see that, but indeed, these two molecules are the same. They're superimposable. Yet I've drawn them in two different ways. What's different about them? Well, you can see there's a few things different about them. Well, I guess the things that are different about them are that the ethyl group and the methyl group have changed relative positions. Over here, the ethyl group is on the left and the methyl group is on the right. In this structure, the ethyl group has moved to the right and the methyl to the left. If that was the only change I had made, without also changing the relative positions of the bromines and the hydrogens, then these would be a pair of enantiomers. But because I also not only changed the relative positions of the two groups that were in the plane of the paper, I changed the relative positions of the two groups that are out of the plane of the paper, what I did ultimately was just redraw the same structure. Let me review this just a little bit. Covered a little bit there. Might be a tiny bit confusing. I'm going to move to a new structure. Here I have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is a 2-chlorohexane. Two 2-chlorohexane. Two but I recognize that carbon-2 is a stereogenic center. It's bound to four different atoms or groups. It's the only stereogenic center on the molecule, so the molecule must be chiral. The highest ranking group is the chlorine, followed by this butyl group on the left, followed by the methyl on the right. As I go from 1 to 2 to 3, this is a clockwise rotation. This will be the R enantiomer, so this particular compound is R, 2-chlorohexane. Now, in order to draw the S, 2-chlorohexane. I could just draw the mirror image. That will always work. I've drawn the mirror image. Now from chlorine to the butyl group to the methyl group and back to the chlorine. It's a counterclockwise rotation. That's S. In both of these cases, the group of lowest priority, the hydrogen at carbon-2, is pointed to the back. So clockwise means R and counterclockwise means S. Going back to this structure, the starting structure, the R, 2-chlorohexane, what if I had left the carbon backbone exactly the same? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But I switch the relative positions of the chlorine and the hydrogen. So now the hydrogen is in the front and the chlorine is in the back. This, as it turns out, is going to be the S enantiomer. It doesn't look quite the same on paper right now as that one right there, but it is. That's their stereogenic center at carbon-2. Chlorine is our highest ranked group, followed by the butyl, followed by the methyl, back to chlorine. This is an R rotation, clockwise rotation R, but the group of lowest priority, the hydrogen, is in the front, so I have to flip that to S. So what I've shown you here once again is that there's two different ways 
to draw the other enantiomer. Assuming we're starting with the R, 2-chlorohexane, you can draw the mirror image. That will always work. Or you can keep the backbone exactly the same and just flip the relative positions of the hydrogen and the chlorine in this case, the two groups that are in and out of the plane of the paper. If these two are both S, then they should be superimposable. Once again, if we took our molecular spatula, and let's say we put it under this molecule right here and flipped it over, it would in fact exactly superimpose on this one. The butyl group would flip to the left, right where that butyl group is. The methyl group would flip to the right, right where that methyl group is. The chlorine, which is now in the front, after flipping would be in the back. The hydrogen, which is in the back, after flipping would now be in the front. They would exactly superimpose. So it works. We can draw the other enantiomer in two different ways. In fact, there's even another way to draw the other enantiomer. What if I left carbon 2 exactly where it was? I'm going back to this starting structure here now. What if I left carbon 2 exactly as it was with the chlorine in the front? And I switched the two groups that are in the plane of the paper. So the methyl group moves to the left and the butyl group moves to the right. Now, it's still a 2-chlorohexane, of course. And it turns out that since I swapped the two groups that were in the plane of the paper, my group of lowest priority, the hydrogen, is still in the back. And this is the S enantiomer. You can see it's exactly the same as that one up there. I basically drew the mirror image in a different way. So, what it boils down to is, if you have a stereogenic center, like we have right here, you can draw the enantiomer, its enantiomer, of this chiral compound in a couple of different ways. One is to draw the mirror image. One is to switch the relative positions of the two groups that are in the plane of the paper and leave the others alone. One is to switch the relative positions of the two groups that are in and out of the plane of the paper and leave the other two alone. Those will all work. Those will all get you to the enantiomer. However, if you switch everything around, if you switch the relative positions of the two groups that are in the plane of the paper, as well as switch the relative positions of the two groups that are in and out of the plane of the paper, you'll actually just be redrawing the same compound. So what you want to do is you want to play around with this a little bit. Draw some molecules, work on the homework problems, assign R and S notations to as many molecules as you can, and you'll start to get the hang of it. You'll see that you can move pretty quickly from an antimer to an antimer. All right, a couple more examples for us. Here's four. Let's look at these molecules. We're going to start with this one right here in the upper left-hand side. Turns out it doesn't matter if I number from left or right. This is three iodo, 5-carbon system, pentane, 3 iodopentane. I don't know if we've drawn that exact molecule before, but we've surely drawn some molecules that are very close to this. Is this molecule chiral? Well, if it is, then we ought to see a stereogenic center somewhere, so let's look around to see if we find one. Over here at carbon 5, no stereogenic center. That's a methyl group. That carbon's bound to three hydrogens, three of the same things. Carbon 4 is bound to two hydrogens. It's a methylene. Carbon 2 is a methylene, and carbon 1 is a methyl. So 1, 2, 4, and 5, they're all carbon atoms that are bound to two or three hydrogen atoms. They can't be stereogenic centers. Clearly, the one that we want to pay attention to is carbon 3. Is it a stereogenic center? The answer is no, it's not a stereogenic center. And the reason is carbon-3 is bound to two ethyl groups. 
you can see that there's an ethyl group there and an ethyl group there. Carbon-3 is bound to two of the same groups. It's not two hydrogens in this case. It's two ethyl groups. But that still renders the molecule achiral. This is not a chiral compound. It does not have a stereogenic center. So as a result, 3-iodopentane is the only, I should say 3-iodopentane exists in only one isomeric form, one stereoisomeric form. And there it is. There's no need for R or S here because there's no stereogenic center. Now let's move over to this compound on the right. In this case, because there's an alkene present, I'm going to have to start numbering from the left. I do not have the option of numbering from the right this time, like I did in the prior example. This is a 1-pentene with a 3-iodo group. So 3-iodo. 1 pentene. It is necessary to include the 1 there because this could be a 2 pentene. So we need to be able to distinguish about which pentene it is we're looking at. There's no need for E or Z here because this is a terminal alkene. There's two bonds to hydrogen emanating from carbon 1 of that terminal alkene functional group. E or Z would not work, and in those cases where E or Z doesn't work, it's not going to be necessary to name it as either E or Z or cis or trans. So nothing is needed above and beyond what we've already got with regards to the alkene, but the question is, are there any stereogenic centers? Now, remember, a stereogenic center is going to be a carbon that's bound to four different atoms or groups. Whenever you see an alkene or an alkyne, those carbons can never be stereogenic centers because they're only bound to three or two groups, depending upon whether it's an alkene or an alkyne. So in other words, let's look carefully at carbon one. There are those two hydrogens we were talking about a minute ago. This carbon one is bound to two hydrogens and one other carbon. It's only bound to three groups total, or I should say three atoms total. As a result, it could never be a stereogenic center. Stereogenic centers are those carbon atoms that are bound to four different atoms or groups. So we quickly realize that in order to be a stereogenic center, it has to be an sp3 hybridized carbon, the sort of carbon you'd see with an alkane or an alkane derivative, never an alkene or an alkyne. So I really only need to focus on carbons three, four, and five and ask the question, are any of those stereogenic centers? Carbon 5 and 4, clearly not. They're bound to multiple hydrogens each. Carbon 3, it's very similar to the carbon 3 we were just looking at. In this case, the molecule is a stereogenic center because it is bound to four different atoms or groups. Unlike the prior case where carbon 3 was attached to two of the same groups, two ethyl groups, we don't have this here. On this side, there's an alkene. On this side, there's an alkane. It doesn't matter that they're both two carbon groups. They're not the same two carbon group. This is an ethyl group, and this is an alkene over here, an ethylene group. So now we have to go ahead and rank the substituents or the atoms coming off of carbon-3. The iodo group would be number one. The carbon of the alkene is going to beat the carbon of the alkane. For purposes of ranking, alkene versus alkane, we treat the alkene as though it were bound to an extra carbon. Since there's a double bond there, it's bound to the same carbon, carbon 1, twice. For naming purposes only or ranking substituent purposes only, we would treat this as though it were an isopropyl group, whereas carbon 2 is actually attached to two carbons, not just one. In other words, it's a more highly substituted carbon than that one over there and that's enough to give it the higher ranking. So it's going to go from the iodine to the alkene over to the alkane. That is a clockwise rotation with the group of lowest priority in the back. That's going to be R. So we would go ahead and put the R designation out in front of the name. Well, if you followed that, then the next two are going to be fairly simple. Here we have a six-membered ring, a cyclohexane in which there's a chlorine on board. So this becomes a chlorocyclohexane. Notice it's not necessary in this case to put a number. 
a 1-chlorocyclohexane is wrong. The 1 is not needed. If I move the chlorine to a different position around this six-membered ring, then that automatically becomes carbon atom number 1. In other words, there is no such thing as a 2-chlorocyclohexane. The only chlorocyclohexane I can have would have the chlorine atom attached to carbon atom number 1. Since that's the only possibility, we don't need to include the 1 in the front. Question is, are there any stereogenic centers? Well, as we look around the ring, most of these carbons are methylenes, meaning they're attached to two hydrogens. So most of them, all of these, uh, are not stereogenic centers. But what about this carbon right here? Is it attached to four different atoms or groups? The way we deal with this in a ring compound is as follows. Clearly, the chlorine is different than the hydrogen. There's no question about that. But what about the ring? We're going to treat it as though it is actually two different substituents. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to say, okay, the suspected stereogenic center here is attached to a methylene on this side, and it's attached to a methylene on that side, but we're going to keep going. So this carbon is attached to a methylene, which in fact is tied to another methylene and another and another and another and back on itself. Or in other words, as I walk around the ring in this counterclockwise direction from the stereogenic center all the way back to itself, I encounter a total of five methylenes. On the other hand, when I walk in a clockwise direction around the ring, I also encounter five different methylenes. Or in other words, this path around the ring like this is exactly the same as that path around the ring. So I'm going to treat these two substituents as identical. That is, this is not a stereogenic center. This carbon right here is bound to two identical substituents. We move over to this one over here. Once again, if I look at all the different carbons, I see the methyl groups could never be stereogenic centers, and neither, neither could any of the methylenes. So it really boils down to this carbon and this carbon. Let's start with this one down here. This carbon is attached to two methyl groups. Those methyl groups are the same. It's attached to two identical functional groups, two methyl groups that cannot be a stereogenic center. Let's move over here. This carbon is attached to a chlorine and a hydrogen, clearly different from one another. Now, as I walk around the ring in this counterclockwise fashion, I have a methylene, 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 followed by a quaternary carbon. So three methylenes and a quaternary carbon. On the other hand, when I move in a clockwise fashion, I have a methylene and then the quaternary carbon. Only one methylene and then I hit the quaternary carbon. That path is different than this path. So we're going to treat those as two different substituents. So indeed, now this carbon is a stereogenic center. Well, is it R? or is it S? The highest rank group would be the chlorine. As we march around the ring in this direction, we hit this highly substituted carbon earlier than we do when we march around in the other direction. So in this direction would be number two, second ranked group. And finally in that direction would be three, and the lowly hydrogen is number four. This gives us one, two, Three, that's a clockwise rotation with the group of lowest priority in the back. That's R. So this molecule is, in fact, a chiral compound. Whenever we see a molecule like this, which has one and only one stereogenic center, it must be chiral. No question about it. And that means it exists as a pair of enantiomers. We happen to have one of them drawn here. The other one would have the stereochemistry switched at this stereogenic center. That is, it would be the R enantiomer, oh, excuse me, it would be the S enantiomer. We've already got the R drawn here. So I hope that makes some sense. This brings us to our last topic. Let's look at these same molecules again, but this time, let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. Let's ask the question, are any of these compounds achiral? 
you see up to this point we've been asking the question are any of these compounds chiral and in order to figure out if they're chiral we've been looking for stereogenic centers but now I'm going to ask if any of them are achiral and it turns out that as I've already mentioned earlier we've encountered a lot of achiral compounds there's plenty of them and there are certain things we can look for in molecules which will be dead giveaways that they are in fact achiral an absence of stereogenic centers is certainly going to be one of those so if you find a molecule that just doesn't have a single stereogenic center in it it's likely that it's achiral turns out there are a few exceptions to that and we'll talk about those later on not today but 99 percent of the time if you find a molecule that has no stereogenic centers in it it will be achiral another thing though that you can do is that you can look for symmetry so achiral molecules have higher symmetry than chiral compounds and in particular what we're usually looking for are things like planes of symmetry which are sometimes known as or called mirror planes so let's go back to this molecule we looked at this molecule a few moments ago this is the one two three four five carbon uh, pentane, the 3 iota pentane, and we decided that this was not a stereogenic center because this is an ethyl group and that's an ethyl group, so carbon 3 is bound to two identical groups, two ethyl groups. But it turns out it's also got a plane of symmetry, and because it has a plane of symmetry, we can immediately recognize it as an achiral structure, which means there's not going to be a single stereogenic center. What is this plane of symmetry? It is literally a plane. A plane is a two-dimensional uh, species or two-dimensional idea. I'm not sure what the right word is here. It's two-dimensional. Planes are two-dimensional. That's probably the best way to say it. And the two-dimensional plane I'm talking about is one that would rip right through the middle of this molecule. It would be perpendicular to the, to the paper. Perpendicular to the paper would be a two-dimensional plane, much like a sheet of paper, running right through the middle of the molecule. And if you think about that two-dimensional plane, everything on the right side, namely carbons 4 and 5, is exactly the same as everything on the left side, carbons 1 and 2. Or in other words, they're mirror images of each other, which is why we call these mirror planes. Everything on the right is the mirror image of everything on the left.